Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Gregory Lopez is an author, editor, and researcher. As a practicing secular Buddhist and Stoic, he is the founder and facilitator of the New York City Stoics Meetup and co-organizer of several Stoicon events. He is the co-author of A Handbook for New Stoics, How to Thrive in a World Out of Your Control, which he wrote with his friend and former guest of our show, Massimo Pigliucci, which you can check out on episode 165 of Boundless Body Radio. Gregory is also on the team for ModernStoicism.com and co-facilitates Stoic Camp New York with our friend Massimo. After stepping down in 2017 as president of Smart Recovery NYC, a nonprofit organization that uses cognitive behavioral therapy to help overcome addiction, he co-founded the Stoic Fellowship, which aims to support and increase in-person Stoic communities worldwide. In addition, he is the lead editor for Examine.com and editor-in-chief of the Examine Research Digest. Gregory currently lives in New York City. City, excuse me, Gregory Lopez. What an honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Thank you for having me, Casey. Absolutely, it's such an honor. Uh, before we talk about um, the stoicism concept, which we'd love to dive into and discuss with you, let's talk about swing dancing. That's uh, one of your passions, I believe. Is that correct? Yep, one of my passions, which I haven't picked up too much since uh, COVID hit, and also I got a knee injury uh, a few years ago, which has kind of limited it to some degree, but I'm hoping to actually get back into it now that COVID is uh, calming down and people have some mitigation measures in place. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I remember the last time I tried swing dancing, it was probably two decades ago, and it did not go well for me. Um, how long have you been doing it? I have been doing it since actually college. Um, I got a little too injured, so my co- my undergrad college had... Um, physical education requirements. And I did a great martial art, uh, rare martial art called Pukalan, an Indonesian martial art, but got a little banged up during doing it. So I wanted to kind of fulfill my PE requirements some other way. So I was kind of like, eh, might as well do this ballroom dancing thing. Um, it'll be silly, but fine. It was the typical kind of <laughs> snotty male <laughs> response to such a thing. But it turned out I actually really liked it and um, particularly was into Lindy Hop. And also um, in Portland, Oregon, I liked the scene for Argentina Teen Tango. And so um, after a few years, I kept at it a little bit and uh, kept on doing it mildly, but then ultimately um, joined a amateur dance troupe that uh, put on some shows for people in nursing homes um, for swing dancing and then became like kind of intermediate level, but I never really competed seriously or anything. And I intend to keep it that way. I, I like being mediocre, but having fun rather than being excellent, but not enjoying it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No, I absolutely love that. That's great. I spent most of my, you know, days like racing, you know, road bikes and mountain bikes and things like that. And it was almost like this great secret that nobody told you that you could just go out and do something for fun rather than compete all the time. That must have been really nice to be able to build that skill set, but but know that you didn't have to like compete or, you know, get to some certain level with it. Yep. Yeah. That brought a lot of, brought a lot of enjoyment for me in it. And also it's a great uh, thing to do when you travel, because I found that you can go to swing dances around the world and just show up and make, meet new people and make new friends. So that's also a, an inroad in addition to also stoicism too, because I co-founded the Stoic Fellowship, uh, a nonprofit that kind of had, that tries to encourage people to form Stoic communities around the world. And so sometimes when I travel, I talk to people about possibly forming communities or visit ex- existing ones. That's fantastic. What a great way to travel. I love that. Um, so we mentioned in the introduction, you are practicing secular Buddhist and Stoic. So I'm wondering which one came first? How did those uh, practices come into your life? So Buddhism did come first, and that came about because there was a subsidized course that I took for mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, which is just a technique to reduce stress, which is Buddhism-influenced, but is kind of a very secular form of Buddhism. And around the same time, I had a friend who was pursuing a master's degree in Buddhist philosophy. And at the time, I didn't think Buddhism had a whole lot to offer because I conceived of it as a religion that required belief in reincarnation. And between doing the mindfulness-based practices um, myself, plus talking to my friend who kind of changed my mind about the notions of how much medical, metaphysical belief you really need in order to practice Buddhism. I got more into it, shopped around, and ultimately settled on, um, I guess I would say early Buddhism is the main thing that interested me. It made the most sense. Um, It provided enough structure without providing too much and too much metaphysical baggage for me. And out of the living traditions, I would probably say I'm most akin to the Thai forest tradition of Theravada Buddhism. 
So that's how I got into Buddhism. And then later on, that kind of instilled some volunteerism in me. I did some volunteer work, um, became ultimately president of Smart Recovery in New York City, where I learned cognitive behavior techniques. And I had a background interest in philosophy, but wasn't very familiar with Hellenistic philosophy, of which Stoicism is a part. And I decided to, since I saw the connection between cognitive behavior therapy and stoicism, I took a look into it a little bit more. And around this time, there were actually online communities that were trying to practice stoicism in the modern world, but there were no in-person communities. So I decided to found New York City Stoics to kind of explore stoicism in person with other people together. Wow. No, that's amazing. What were some of the differences between Buddhism and Stoicism or what was lacking in Buddhism that made you look elsewhere for some of the main principles in Stoicism? I think modern uh, Buddhism, at least in the Theravadan tradition, has a key issue that people in modernity struggle with, which is social service and getting out into the world. Um, while a lot of lay Buddhists in the early Buddhist sutras um, are shown to be able to achieve, make a lot of progress mentally with Buddhist practice, if reading it enough just kind of seems to imply that at the end of the day, you really need to at least go on very long meditation retreats that people can't do really because of cost or jobs or other family obligations. Um, and also it requires some withdrawal from the world. And that withdrawal makes a lot of sense given the goals of meditative practice in Buddhism. But um, at the same time, a lot of Buddhist circles in modernity in the modern West wanted to kind of move to social justice issues, which I agree with to some extent, and um, essentially service and trying to make the world at least a little bit better. But that seems to rub up against the Buddhist teachings because it really does have some issues in grading your mental tranquility. Um, and there, I've seen modern attempts at trying to circumvent this, but I, I think they don't completely solve the issue for a variety of reasons, whereas Stoicism was really centered around getting out into the world and engaging with other things, uh, other, uh, other people and issues at hand. And so that's the kind of gap that I think Stoicism fills, um, that Buddhism has some struggle maintaining. Interesting. So you mentioned the retreats and, you know, I've certainly noticed that in the, in the Buddhist community, is it possible to practice Buddhism fully with, with, you know, still remaining in the world or does that become very, very difficult? Oh yeah, it's absolutely possible to practice Buddhism in the world. And there's a whole lot of stuff. Um, so the early sutras lay out um, something that's called the gradual path that starts with a very slow practice um, in which you do things step by step. And often it's something when I have, am struggling with something and my meditation practice is not going well, I often turn to the gradual path and also something called ascendant dependent origination, which is kind of the a positive feedback loop that was described by the Buddha in one place, or at least one place, um, but relatively rarely, in order to see why my meditation may not be going well. Um, so it definitely can be done, but I think there is an open question about how successful one can be um, in doing that. Every meditator who's been on a retreat, or many of them have an experience of finding tranquility after coming off of a week or two of meditation and then getting back in the car and immediately getting angry when somebody cuts you off on the highway. <laughs> and so it's a, it, it can be fragile depending on how much uh, progress one makes during meditation and progress in the steps leading to meditative absorption. Um, so definitely possible progress can be made, but I think that stoicism supplementing it can kind of help uh, with mental tranquility when trying to act in the world and also help guide when you may not want to act in the world because one is simply not ready enough. Interesting. Yeah. I, I remember the phrase, something like, you know, I could go up in the mountains and meditate for a week or whatever, but I still have laundry to do. Like at some point you have to realize that we're still part of the world. And it seems like you were able to find that in stoicism. I'm curious, like what ways did stoicism really improve your life? I would probably say that it encouraged me more to try to get out. I'm an introvert by heart and um, I'm not necessarily into um, like trying to go out and like make large improvements in the world in order to save the world. I think stoicism allowed me to encourage me to do that a little bit more, but also keep my um, keep my proclivities and strengths and weaknesses in mind when doing so. Um, and so I think it helps me try to be a better person overall and provides a little more guidance than I found in other sources. Sure. Well, being an introvert, was it difficult for you to organize those meetups in New York City? Yes. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is. And that's, but I've kept at it since 2013. So like, that's a, guess a solid example. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Did you guys meet virtually during the pandemic? Yes, we did. And actually, we still are meeting virtually. I um, uh, I found that a lot of people in New York City Stoics started coming when I moved online during the pandemic from around the country and actually the world. Um, so I actually kept them the main component of New York City Stoics online. So those people can continue to attend. And currently, we're doing meetups where um, they're more open discussion because I think online in-person meetups have a lot to offer. Um, but at the same time, the technology is not quite there for back and forth organic discussion. You can't quite see everybody's facial expressions and um, people can't interrupt each other and read body language when one person's done and things like that. Whereas if you're sitting around in person in a circle, you get to know each other more and also get to have more organic conversation. So I currently hold two meetups for New York City Stoics, an online reading group, which is kind of a little bit more of me lecturing with pauses for questions and comments, and an in-person, less formal meetup where we just sit down and discuss whatever's people, whatever's on people's minds that is related to Stoicism. Interesting. So it sounds like the first iterations of these meetups were more of the latter and less of the former, where it was kind of an open discussion, not necessarily like you saying like, hey, I've learned all this stuff about Stoicism that I want to teach you, but more like, let's discuss different different issues and problems. Is that safe to say? Um, I think it's actually the other way around. I started um, giving, so the main thing that encouraged me to do this meetup was because I knew that I would be more likely to retain things if I was beholden to others and had to present certain materials. So it was definitely more organic and a lot more room for back and forth. Um, because on Zoom, for instance, you know, if you have 30 people and two people have background noise and their mics unmuted, you just, it's it's very hard to parse what's going on and you can't see everybody that's on screen or and so on and so forth. So I still did kind of do rigorous deep dives into the Stoic literature and Stoic tangential literature, um, but there was a lot more room for back and forth. I also ran for about four years different forms of practice groups, and the first form of the practice group that I did was a more open where people kind of came and met once a month to discuss what's going on in their life from a Stoic perspective. And that was a little more looser, but then I actually tightened up that um, that curriculum a little bit for future iterations of the practice group because I found that people didn't quite have a firm understanding or the same understanding of what Stoicism actually is. So it's hard to come at things from a Stoic perspective when people don't quite understand what the Stoic perspective would be. Yeah, that's a really fair point and probably a good time to discuss that. What is Stoicism at its core and what are some of the main teachings? So I would say Stoicism in a nutshell, um, I would define as a life philosophy whose goal is to make you the best person and best you you can be. Um, that's my informal definition of it. And it differs from a lot of other life philosophies that came up during the Hellenistic period and even the pre-Hellenistic period in uh, the Greco-Roman times, in that they all had different goals. And one thing that these philosophies all share is that they all kind of assume that a life philosophy has to provide one main goal in which to try to gain. Um, and there can be some blending going on. For instance, Aristotelianism uh, has a blend of goals where they put virtue as the highest good thing that you have to pursue the most in life. But they acknowledge that other things are necessary in order to lead to human flourishing. Um, Stoicism is different in that they put the focus primarily on I would say personal improvement, becoming a better human being and being the best version of you that's possible. And so those are different things in that um, there are some universal characteristics the Stoics claim to that, that all humans have. The first is that one of the things that makes us human is that we are able to think well and abstractly. And so modern science and um, may have pushed back a little against the Stoics for this in that we now see that um, a wide range of animals can have some form of cognition and reasoning, but humans are still leaps and bounds above other animals. We have a full, fully formed language and things like that. So crows can form and use basic tools, but crows cannot create machine heavy machinery in order to create cars, for instance. And so there and animals can communicate through sound and even may have names for each other, but um, none of them can necessarily write lyric poetry. As far as we can tell, maybe in the future that will change. So while humans and animals share some characteristics, we are better at abstract reasoning than animals are. The other thing that makes us human is that we tend to do better when we work together. So um, there's a lot of like, so if people put goals in life as being like healthy or strong or like athleticism, for instance, it being like uh, doing really well at racing, well, you can be good for a human, 
but you still can't outrun a cheetah. Um, and you can try to be strong, but you'll never be as strong as a gorilla. So people, humans who kind of maximize these things are not ever going to be the best of kind, period. Whereas humans who focus on um, rationality can be. And also we can even outdo animals in some regard, like fly faster and go faster on ground. But we do that by cooperating with each other, exchanging knowledge and creating technologies in order to do that. We don't do that by simply putting more weight on the barbell of the gym, because no matter how much you do and how, <laughs> how much you juice up, you're probably not going to outdo some of the strongest animals that are out there. So that's stoicism's part of its goal is to become a better human being by being more pro-social and being more rational. And then there's um, the specifics of that, how it cashes out. Each person is different and in a different role and place in life. And so stoicism tries to make people the best versions of themselves that they can be, knowing that some people are simply have different interests and different strengths and weaknesses than others. And so that's why stoicism in a nutshell is trying to make you the best human and the best you possible. Gotcha. It's so interesting. Um, part part of what kind of fits in into stoicism are some of these like core, you know, principles and, and lessons to learn along the way. And one of them is the dichotomy of control. Can you talk a little bit about the dichotomy of control and how that fits in? Yes. So the dichotomy of control is most clearly put by a late Stoic philosopher, Epictetus, who was a slave turned Stoic teacher and um uh, lived during the Roman imperial times and was quite a famous teacher during that time. You can see maybe hints of it in earlier Stoic stuff, but um, Epictetus is the person who really lays that out. And it's the way that most people come into Stoicism. That's how they're introduced to it. But it's also a bit of a double-edged sword because it's easy to misunderstand and leads to a kind of dark form of Stoicism that I don't necessarily advocate. So the dichotomy of control says that there are things that are up to us and things that are not up to us. And it gives a list, uh, Epictetus gives a list of four specific things that are up to us. And those things are desires, aversions, impulses to act, and thoughts or opinions, I would uh, say. And you can kind of boil this down a little further to essentially say like um, desires and aversions are kinds of goals, things you're trying to go for or get away from. So your goals, your what you want to do, your impulses to act, to use a slightly more technical term, and then um, your opinions or thoughts, which I kind of cash out as your conscious views of the world, things that you consciously shape and say to yourself. And so that is all that is up to us, according to Epictetus. That is uh, not just a part, not just our minds, but a very small subset of our minds. And so stoic training can be kind of cashed out in terms of the dichotomy of control by caring more about those three to four things and trying to care less about anything else that is not up to one. And if you do this over time, you will tend to be less frustrated and upset because you're focusing on things that are completely up to you. And at the same time, you start clearing the way to start becoming a better human being. The dichotomy of control is primarily applied within the first of Epictetus's three-phase training program, which are um, called the three disciplines, or were called the three disciplines uh, by the scholar Pierre Hadot, um, and he named them specifically. Epictetus doesn't actually name them in his own writings, but they're clearly there. Um, and so the dichotomy of control is probably best applied in the first discipline to some degree. And a lot of people kind of stop there when it comes to stoic practice and say, I'm going to apply the dichotomy of control so I could be less upset. And I think that gives short shrift to stoic practice because the main reason why Epictetus wanted to focus on the dichotomy of control was not so that we feel better, but that we create the opportunity to be better people. By getting a firm grip on the dichotomy of control, or firm enough grip at least, one can then move on to the second discipline, which is the discipline of action where ethics occurs. And unfortunately, I see a lot of people misinterpreting stoicism and stopping at the first um, at the first phase of just applying the dichotomy of control, which can lead to some dark outcomes if you don't give a crap that you're hurting other people. Um, then because, you know, whether whether they're suffer or upset at you is not up to you. So I don't care about that. Then that can lead to a kind of misguided form of stoicism that I try to advocate against. 
Well, if there's any doubt of that, you can just look back on how we acted during the pandemic and you'll see kind of how we handled things that way about not not caring about others, I would say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So let's talk about that first discipline. I think this is really interesting. And I, this is exactly the way you guys formatted the handbook, which I can't recommend to the, to the listener highly enough. A handbook for new Stoics is such a wonderful journal. It's got great lessons, things to write in every day, every single week. It, it's really a very good and practical guide and something that I've been doing over the course of the last year and gotten a lot out of. Um, and you've divided that book into three parts, which are the three disciplines. So let's, let's deep dive in each one of those. Um, we've already talked a little bit about the first one, but let's go a little bit deeper. What, and the first one is called, um, what was it now? The discipline of desire. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about some other tenets of the, of the discipline of desire. So Epictetus lays out the goal of this, um, discipline of desire to do two main things. And so essentially any practice that you can think of that's related to these outcomes is probably safe to say falls well within the discipline of desire. And so there are two goals for the discipline of desire. And it's better fleshed out as saying maybe the discipline of desire and aversion, because again, it's more about goals, what you're going for, desires, and what you want to avoid, aversions. So Epictetus says that we should try to do try to tame our desires as much as possible to dampen them. And so if, if you want things, try to train yourself to want them less through various exercises. And for aversions, um, in a fancy language, he says we should transfer our aversions from externals to internals, essentially. And that is a little hard to parse. And we try to do it in week two of the handbook. But um, I've talked to some readers who had trouble kind of understanding it. But essentially boils to down to not caring about outcomes, but caring that you cared about outcomes. And so trying to make yourself not like you're clinging, being afraid of stuff and the mental stuff that's associated with that instead of worrying that things are going to go wrong because that's outside of your control. And if you focus on, if you kind of think about these desires and aversions, they seem like um, two sides of the same coin, but yet there's an asymmetry going on there. The Epictetus tells us that we should dampen our desires Whereas he says we should transfer our desires from external uh, our aversions from externals to internals. And there's a question of why isn't Epictetus also saying care less about externals and care more about internals? And he gives an answer to this question. And the answer is that he says you're not the early trainee is not ready yet to um, desire what is really desirable, which is making yourself a better person until you get a handle on this. So and it doesn't have to be a perfect handle. In fact, it probably can't be a perfect handle, but it sh you should improve in areas where it's having you're having trouble. And so that's the discipline of desire. It is to try to get a better hold of your mind by caring more about what your mind's doing as opposed to what's happening around you and by trying to weaken your desires as much as possible through a, a whole bunch of exercises. Interesting. And it's important to note too, that the Stoics use the concept of preferred indifference. Like it's okay to have preferences. Like if you want to be healthy, that's an okay thing. Um, if you want to be wealthy, that's an okay thing too. It's not that you're supposed to shun the things that you want. It's just that they are exactly that a preferred indifference. I prefer this, but if this doesn't happen, that doesn't affect my, my, you know, my character, it doesn't impact my virtue. And so that those things, acquiring those things is, is, doesn't take me off course of being the person that I want to be, correct? Yep, that's correct. And so you can't act in the world without choosing things. And that's kind of actually how um, Cato in Cicero's um, On the Ends of Good and Evil puts it. He says, the Stoic, um, Cicero's Cato says that you, you choose instead of desiring. And so a desire is something that is strong, that if you didn't get it, you would be upset and that you would actually turn, you would try to like push other people out of the way and harm other people in order to get the thing. So if one of those two criteria are met, then it's a desire. If it's not, if you just like, oh, I'd prefer, you know, I'd prefer to have salad for lunch today as opposed to um, uh, stale bread or something, <laughs> go for the salad. Um, that's fine. Um, you have to choose things in order to work in the world, but it should be this light selection as opposed to being upset if you didn't get it. And that's a kind of mental test to tell the difference between desires and choices. Interesting. Yeah. I really like that insight in the desire of, or the discipline of desire, excuse me. Um, this is where we find our first exercise in negative visualization. And this one was really tough for me in the beginning because it feels like you're, you're being really pessimistic, but it's, it's really not. Can you explain the concept? of negative visualization and how people can apply it for benefit? Yeah, so negative visualization is trying to imagine an outcome. Um, there are actually quite a few ways of doing it, and we lay out a couple of ways in the book because um, there's no like single 
place where negative visualization is laid out as a single thing in the ancient literature. There are things that could be identified as negative visualization, but a lot of different ways of doing it. So essentially what you're trying to do is simulate somehow something that you would normally consider bad happening to you that um, you are averse to. Um, And it's essentially a specific way to transfer aversions from externals to internals. So you consciously try to simulate something going awry and then Um, allow your emotions to take hold, but also possibly take a look at what the assumptions are and try to correct your thought process so that you can, in any way that is possible, in order to take the sting out of it and to not be so upset about what's occurring. And this happens through probably a couple of different mechanisms. One is probably just mere exposure, that if you visualize something as if it's happening to you and you do get upset or afraid from it, um, if you repeatedly do that a few times reliably without flinching away, the feeling on its own will kind of de- de- decay because of mere exposure, because your mind's anticipating some harm, but yet um, no harm is actually occurring. And so you can kind of lessen the sting that way. But it's also an opportunity to try to rehearse um, what you would do that would be more desirable and virtuous in a given situation. And so it gives you the opportunity to any, to do anything from internally reframe thoughts to actually trying to act against those urges and practicing it mentally. We know a little bit from psychology that mental um, rehearsal does have at least some carryover effect to physical performance. So if you can rehearse something mentally a few times and that situation comes up, you're at least more likely, although not guaranteed, to be able to act the way you wanted to when it does come up. So it's a kind of mental training, uh, to paraphrase Bruce Lee's uh, saying that uh, you uh, during times of duress, you fall to the level of your training. And so negative visualization is kind of a way to rehearse that consistently so that you, it becomes more of a mental habit so that if it does happen in the real world, you have a better chance of reacting more um, in a more desirable way. Yeah. Interesting. No, I'm glad you used the word training. I was just thinking to myself, this sounds exactly like, you know, going to a gym or lifting heavy weights or something like that. You're, you're doing this voluntarily when you don't need to, but you're trying to keep yourself strong so that you can be resilient when the actual challenge comes. Yep. Yeah. There's, um, yeah. And that's an important distinction to make between doing it intentionally and willingly and, um, not like so for instance it, it would be pretty cruel uh like if to if somebody had like panic attacks to try to <laughs> surprise them and say oh you're doing it um uh you're in the panic attack now and you'll get this will make you stronger no it won't it'll just make them want to stay away from you <laughs> um the um Yeah, but when you go to the gym, you know you're going to be uncomfortable, but you're kind of doing it intentionally in the goal of making it less uncomfortable and to become a little stronger. And so that is a good analogy. Um, And at the same time, the there's a little bit of a difference if you like go to the gym. There's like a way to go to the gym as a stoic and way to the gym to go to the gym and not (laughs) do it because the main purpose of like physical exercise for some people is aesthetics and. things like that. And so people can insta like get in front of the mirrors and do their selfies and stuff. But, um, and also some people are averse to, for instance, cardio and just want to do weight training because it has more aesthetic appeal to them. Um, so if uh, let's say a hypothetical stoic was really into physique and stuff, um, and wanted to go to the gym and this is more of a side tangent, one of the exercises they could do to expose themselves to it is to not lift weights for a couple of weeks and instead just get on the treadmill and, uh, do that. And they may not like it because they may not like the feeling or they may not, they may not like the consequences, but that would be going to to the gym in a way because it's a mental training exercise to try to get over your aversions. Sure. Well, maybe this is a good segment into um, the second discipline, the discipline of action, because I think this is where a lot of those concepts come into place, where you're starting to learn about how to deal with, you know, seemingly difficult people and where they're coming from. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about the discipline of action? Yep. So the discipline of action is something that um, you start to do after you get some basic handle on the desires and aversions in the first one. And these things can transfer over and sometimes domains overlap. So for instance, you could get a basic handle on physical discomfort, but maybe still have a lot of trouble with public speaking or something like that. In which case, just uh, don't necessarily go out there with public speaking yet and try to slowly over time work on that aversion. But if you're good with physical discomfort, then you can go on and try to do intentional actions and help other people um, in ways that may provide you with some physical discomfort. And so the main goals of the discipline of action are to act intentionally, not in a knee-jerk way, and act um, for the benefit of other people, um, or at least not harming them. And so the training there is primarily around 
making sure that when you're acting, trying to check yourself and make sure that you are doing what you're doing intentionally as opposed to just out of habit and that you have a reason for it that is um, for other people's benefit or at least considering that you're not harming others when doing it. And you kind of do this for the big things in life. It's not like necessarily you go for a walk and say, before I step out the door, am I going to step on any bugs or something? You can start with um, like the more gross things and work your way down if you want or just focus on the things that um, cause you that you act, that you are in a position to do something about or that um, cause you particular difficulty and work your way up in a scaled fashion there. Sure. Uh, one of my favorite chapters is called Deal, Deal Virtually with Frustrating People. And he used a lengthy quote from Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, where he goes through and talks about all the different reasons why his assumptions about somebody being difficult might be wrong or why they might not matter. Anyway, can you tell us why you decided to include that in the book? I love that part. Yeah, it's one. It's like a list of 10 exercises that Marcus Aurelius gives himself in order to try to remember and bring into focus. And we put it in the discipline of action because when acting socially, um, one of the big obstacles to that is finding other people that you're frustrated with. And so this is a list of different exercises that Marcus told himself he can try to do. And we present that entire list because one of the main philosophies of a handbook for new Stoics is that not every exercise is going to be relevant or effective for every single person. And this um, chapter, I think it's in week 25, is a microcosm of that philosophy where Marcus is throwing out 10 different things to do, and you can try some on for size to see what works for you particularly. And they range the gamut um, from kind of trying to take the sting out of the surprise of it. Um, I think the 10th one is if you um, it's kind of my fault for believe being upset about other people when I know that bad people do bad things. So what's my problem? <laughs> and it, that's kind of flipping the upset on its head and saying, why am I surprised or shocked by this? It's my fault that I am surprised or shocked because I know such people in the world exist. And there are also ones that I particularly like more is um, like number four, I think, where you um, ask yourself, how am I like that? Um, and I think that's particularly useful because it kind of shows a form of uh, mental Aikido that the Stoics sometimes ideally try to show is that when we're upset with other people, we're often like that in a similar way, and we can't control what other people do. That's one of the primary lessons of the first discipline, but we can control ourselves. And so if I'm upset that um, somebody seems to be greedy, are there any cases where have I, I've act, acted greedy in the past? Okay, well, let me go back and later on tonight, go journal about that and maybe come up with a plan in which I can try to loosen that up a little bit. Um, and once that is done, I can then stop being so upset about other what other people are doing and try to um, act despite um, social obstacles or in order to possibly help them see what how their actions are harmful it, only when I'm ready and only when I have my own house in order, so to speak. Yeah. Interesting. I, my favorite was the sixth one where he, I've, I've even asked you about this translation, which, um, I didn't know was in Greek. Actually, I thought it was in Roman, but, um, or whatever he would, what, what did they speak in ancient Rome? Um, so it was Latin primarily, um, although the educated class did use Greek. Um, and so Marcus was writing to himself because in Greek, because he was primarily tutored in philosophy in Greek. So he, um, his journal was in Greek. As far as we know, we don't have like the original pages that Marcus wrote by hand, but it's a probably a pretty good guess given that our oldest manuscripts are in, we have manuscripts in Greek and we know Marcus would have known Greek and was trained in it. So that's kind of like the the fancy pants language. Yeah. But I they see. did speak Latin. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And in and, and the sixth phrase, he says, you know, a little while and we all lie stretched in death. And the point being like, why do I care so much about this when eventually we're all going to meet the same fate anyway? I think it's a really interesting perspective and really changed my viewpoint on, you know, some of those things that we get so worked up about all the time. Yeah, and I, I, it's interesting to see diversity in how people apply this. Sometimes uh, when I use it and when others use it, like some people kind of take it more to heart for themselves. Like, I'm going to die one day. Why am I wasting my time on this? And that's perfectly good. And But another interesting different interpretation is like, this person's going to die. Why am I about to leap at their, like spend my time yelling at them when they have a limited time and I'm going to make their limited time more miserable by doing this? Um, so there are different, it's interesting how, when, one applies these things, how you can get a lot of nuance from practice that are, that is not apparent necessarily on the page. 
I never considered that. I absolutely never considered that viewpoint. I really appreciate you saying that because I, I never really thought about it looking from the other side. Um, that's great. Um, uh, the third discipline, the discipline of ascent. I did okay when I was working with the discipline of desire. I'd been you know, somewhat familiar with the Stoic concepts before, so I did okay with that one. The second one, the discipline of action, you know, was was challenging for me. Certain lessons, certain lessons were more so than others. I have to say, like being in the middle of the discipline of ascent, I am struggling. <laughs> In the beginning of the of the section, you guys mentioned like, look, this is you know a little bit more advanced, and you're probably not going to become a sage. So I I put aside any notion that one day I'd be you know the wise man that somebody would be coming to for advice about anything. But um, the discipline of ascent is a lot more challenging. Is that something you get from a lot of people? Yes, uh, yeah, and Epictetus lays it out as such. I mean, he explicitly says that the third discipline, the discipline of ascent, is only meant for those who have made progress in the first two disciplines. And it's that way for two main reasons. The first is that you have to pay attention and be able to have enough skill in logic or dissecting one's own thoughts in order to analyze the thoughts as they come up correctly. And secondly, it's different from the first two disciplines, not in topics. You're actually still dealing with the same stuff of your desires, versions, and actions. But what is different is that instead of kind of laying out a premeditated exercise to do like you would in the discipline of desire and the discipline of action, you try to go about your daily life and catch the initial stirrings as soon as they arise. And that is the biggest failure mode of practice I find for myself. Like it's just forgetting, you know, I have, I'm going to go, I'm going to do some work and I sit down and I'm focused on the work. And so if I get a notification that, and get so slightly annoyed by that, I wasn't keeping my mind on trying to watch my thoughts and temper annoyance. I was keeping my mind on work. And so how does one balance those things? Well, by training, like <laughs> it, it's hard, it's easier said than done. Um, but that's why the first two disciplines come first and, um, that that this third discipline is put toward the end because it's hard to catch oneself on the fly in these kinds of circumstances. Sure. What would be one way that somebody could know they were making progress in this discipline? Um, one way, I guess, is just actually noticing that you notice is the first thing um, or noticing that your behavior has changed after the fact for something that repeatedly comes up. And so, uh, for instance, you could just use a tally uh, counter where you um like here's like one thing that i sometimes do is when i have some trouble i put on a a reminder note um on my phone um like focus on um annoyance this week and then every morning when i wake up i have my reminder saying focus on annoyance this week and it i leave that on my phone for the day so whenever i look at it it, t it reminds me that that's my goal um and then i have a tally counter also on my phone where I can actually put a whole bunch of different tallies, but I usually just focus on one thing because I, I prefer to drill rather than having my mind scattered about multiple things. And so um, every time I get annoyed and catch it, um, I put a tally mark on there and then I can kind of track it. I don't do this too often. I don't do like quantified self kind of things. This is a little, this is quasi formal, not completely formal, but I do try to see whether I've at least made progress over the week or two where I'm drilling it um, in order to see whether things have subsided. If not, then I can revisit, like maybe journal about why uh, things are going awry. Interesting. So when did you and Massimo come up with the idea to, to write this book and make it the format that it is something very practical that you write in, um, you know, versus just another book similar to what Massimo's already written, you know, a few of. Yeah. So there are a couple of things that came into our considerations. The first is that we decided to run um, Stoic Camp New York. Um, I forget when we started, I think 2014 or 2015. Um, so there's this uh, philosopher at the University of Wyoming, Rob Coulter, who on his own created Stoic Camp, just plain old Stoic Camp. And this was before Massimo and I started running things. Um, and in Wyoming, they have a lot more opportunity to camp than uh, <laughs> than we do in New York City, that's for sure. So, um, <laughs> um, so uh, Rob Coulter kind of started this idea and Massimo and I picked up on it and decided to Stoic Camp New York um, uh, after consulting with Rob, of course. And uh, now it's kind of a open source idea. Anybody who wants to start their own Stoic camp, they're welcome to do so. And I can reach out to me and the Stoic Fellowship if you're interested in just getting some input in there. But um, we decided to run this Stoic camp because we saw that, I mean, there just wasn't much like it besides Rob's. Um, and we wanted to have people get an intensive introduction to Stoicism. And so we went up to Stony Point Center in Stony Point, New York, and held intensive introductions to Stoicism. And 
we had different formats for Stoic Camp and we still do create different formats. And during the research process, we had a whole pile of exercises from the Stoic literature that were just sitting there. And so Massimo suggested um, that we cover, we, we kind of curate them and write a book based off of them. So um, we did, he suggested this because they're just a lot, there are a lot of introduction to Stoic books out there, but some, and some of them had exercises, but there wasn't a focus dr place to drill Stoic exercises and one that presented a whole bunch of options for people. And so because of uh, my limited but existent background in cognitive behavioral techniques, um, I'm familiar with like the format of cognitive behavior workbooks in general. You can get a lot of great workbooks for anxiety and depression and um, dialectical behavior therapy applied to various things. And those are like the best best biblia um like uh book focused ways of trying to work through kind of therapeutic techniques yourself and while stoicism is a philosophy not therapy there are exercises that are well suited to workbooks and so i kind of uh suggested to massimo that we create something akin to uh a psychological workbook in that sense and that's how it came together from a mix of the pile of exercises we um took from Stoic Camp New York mixed with the idea of kind of making a workbook format so people drilled it. Yeah, interesting. I asked Massimo the same question I'm about to ask you. Was it difficult to come up with 52 unique different exercises to do during the year? His answer surprised me, so I'm curious to hear what you're going to say. I didn't listen to his uh, <laughs> his podcast beforehand, so Good. I wonder if I'll contradict him. But um, I would say, yes, it sort of was although there are some higher quality exercises that are very clear and a lot of and pretty popular and also like if you're if you follow the book um closely as we recommend though it doesn't have to be used that way um you'll find that there's repetition of I certain ideas that occur like some things that occur in the discipline of desire will reoccur in a slightly more focused way from using a different quote as a foundation in the discipline of ascent so um there is repetition of some core themes and i would say it was a little mildly difficult but probably i think maybe like 80 percent of the exercises did pop out due to the high quality of the quote um and the clarity of the exercise associated with it or the popularity of it, like people, everybody who's into stoicism knows of ne negative visualization. So we had to tackle that as well. So I'd say eh, there was some challenge, but I guess it wasn't like super duper hard. Okay. Do you want to know his answer? Yes. Yeah. He said it was really uh, more on the easy side and they had to cut, you guys had to cut out a lot of different exercises that you wanted to include so that it yeah. would fit into a, a weekly format for a year. Yeah, we did have to, we did have to cut some stuff out. Um, I think there were maybe like a couple of things. And also we had to like, we, there were some things that we just couldn't even include, which are a quasi part of stoic, important part of stoic practice, because they're not like simple exercises that one can drill, like two big things that are missing that are probably important to stoic practice that, that we couldn't include in a workbook format are um, the idea in the discipline of action called role ethics, which um, there's an excellent academic book, which is still readable by Brian Johnson called the role ethics of Eth Epictetus. And that is a way of applying the discipline of action um, in a more fluid way. You're not drilling exercises. Instead, you're considering your role in various circumstances and trying to act appropriately according to your role. And actually, I'm very, very slowly working on an online course right now um, that is uh, at stoicmissingpieces.com. Uh, that's going to be my foundation. I have like two courses that I want to do. And one of them is going to be on applied role ethics. Like how do you actually apply this to living your life? Um, that's one thing that we can't include because we can't just say, do this thing for a week and try it out. It's like an entire system of how to thinking, thinking how to act. Um, and the other thing we could include was logic itself. Like Epictetus actually did teach formal logic and it's important to understanding Stoic theory and to a mild degree practice, although it's better done like very late. So it's not a big deal if people don't know basic logic, but um the Stoics, even up through Epictetus and even Marcus Aurelius, applied actual formal logic. There are specific passages in the med meditations where you can see that he's using formal logic, even though he himself in Meditations 1 says, I'm not good at this logic and physics stuff. I just focus on the ethics. But if you read certain parts of the meditations, it's interesting that he puts things like in hypothetical syllogism format and stuff like that. Wow, that's crazy. I, I didn't, it didn't really occur to me that, that, you know, now that so many people have gone through, you know, the handbook, that they would have, you would have, I guess, a better insight as to which lessons were most popular and other lessons that were more challenging. Were there certain patterns you noticed um, for the more popular ones and for the ones that were very challenging for people? 
Um, it's, I'm not calling offhand. I, the one that sticks out to be for challenging was uh, week two. And if we ever come out with a second edition, um, I would probably rewrite that chapter entirely because it focuses on that very important concept that we kind of maybe uh, didn't describe too well of transferring aversions from externals to internals. And all that really means is like just caring more about your thoughts rather than outcomes. Um, so that was a challenge for a lot of people. Um, and I would probably kind of rework that section as for the things that worked for people. I think it was a little bit scattered and that was, that's part of the interesting thing about it. I actually led, um, a view from above. Um, I forget what week that is off the top of my head, but where you kind of visualize yourself floating above the fray in order to try to gain distance and calm yourself down. Um, and I led a, a medita- like a visual, a guided visualization in that one time. And one person um, said that it made them more anxious um, because they had to focus on the th- trouble that they were experiencing. And um, even while they're floating up above it and trying to visualize first their block, then the city, then oh, the continent, and ultimately the world, um, they're still like still focused on that event in the center. And so it didn't work for them. So... I, yeah, I don't, I think that th- nobody's ever gone, I, I've never heard anybody go through a lot of the exercises and say none of them worked in stoicism, stupid. Um, but I, there's a lot of scatter, like some things that work for others don't work for others in sometimes surprising ways. Well, I really appreciate that you acknowledge that. And like you said, after every lesson, there's a there's a box that you can check to say, like, what do you think? Was this helpful for you or not? It, we're, we're just showing you this. This might not apply to everybody the same way, but just check this box if you think this is something you can come back to and will be very helpful. I, I'm, I'm assuming you don't get more commission or less commission if somebody does a lesson or doesn't do a lesson. You guys are just presenting really good options for people and leaving it in their hands to determine, you know, is this helpful for you? You know, now it also could be something that maybe you don't grasp now but down the road in a few years you'll have a better handle on it based on your life circumstances yeah and that's another thing that um yeah sometimes an exercise could be useful it's just not useful to you at that specific time because you have other some something going on in your life and the exercise isn't relevant um and so like some so like uh week 24 and the 10 uh, items that Marcus says for annoyance. Maybe you're just, uh, maybe you're in a pandemic, for instance, and not seeing people too often. um, So you're not too annoyed, but now you're getting on planes and going on public transportation a little more. And now you're encountering more people. And then you did, if you did a handbook for new Stoics like a year ago, that wasn't relevant. Maybe now it's time to revisit that. Um, And that's another challenge as well. So sometimes not only can exercises work or not work for specific people, but sometimes they're more relevant than others. And we give people some guidance in the epilogue in order to try to put together their own curriculum and create a little basket of exercises so that they can dig through that curated basket of stuff that they think would have been useful um, and then kind of drill those if and when the time arises. Sure. I think in that sense, it would be interesting to just do a new handbook every year and almost compare it like year to year to see, you know, what things hit home this year based on, again, life circumstances or where you are personally in life or what lessons you've learned along the way. Is that something you recommend that somebody grab a new copy every year? Um, uh, it depends on whether my publisher is listening or not. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Of course. Yes. Every week, actually uh, buy a new one. Um, Perfect. <laughs> uh, it, re- it really, yeah, it depends. I mean, it does get marked up. So if you, um, if you, if you want to actually go through it, then that is, um, yeah, that's useful. I've bought a, multiple copies of various books because I've marked them up too much sometimes and moved more electronic also for that reason, though I actually recommend the paper uh, for this one because it's a workbook and that's one of the few things I buy in paper nowadays. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I I think my hope would be actually that they have a smaller set to work from. Um, and maybe they could like get another copy and dog ear certain portions that and go straight to those exercises um, and kind of revisit. Um, I initially have trouble imagining that like redoing the entire year repeatedly would be as of use. But also I had trouble uh, thinking that the view from above could actually induce an anxiety in somebody. Yet it happened. So sure. my 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 suggestion is if that sounds like it could be useful to you, might as well give it a go um, and try it because that's the only way you're going to know at the end is to at least start to try it. Yeah, no, great point. I love that. Tell us a little bit about Stoic Week. I found that to be kind of an amazing resource, even though I haven't participated. Going back and downloading some of the guides um, that you guys provide for free is actually pretty amazing. It also has some lessons and tools, you know, incorporated in that week. Can you tell us what Stoicism Week is and how you've been able to incorporate those resources as well? 
Yes. So I I am on the advisory committee for modern stoicism, although I admittedly play a small part. Um, I definitely have not organized multiple Stoicon events, which I think you may have said in your introduction. I just want to clear it. I did co-organize Stoicon 2016 in New York City and have uh, presented at a few of them. Um, But I'm on the advisory committee, but a little bit on the sideline. But I have been doing some analysis of Stoic Week data because I do a little bit of uh, data science on the side. Um, Mm. So I... Um, so Stoic Week is a wonderful resource uh, put forward by Modern Stoicism. I'm on the advisory committee for that. Um, and that is a nonprofit founded in the UK. And they um, put on the annual StoicCon conference, um, which used to be in person and is currently online for the foreseeable future. Um, because a lot of people really liked the online conference. Um, we heard over and over again when we were online by necessity during the pandemic that people couldn't make it to the conference due to obligations or cost. And there was just, uh, it opened up the opportunity for a lot more people. So that's a benefit to having online. Um, but Stoic Week is free. And it is a week-long pamphlet where people get to dip their toes into Stoicism and try some Stoic practices um, and take them for a spin. They often have themes associated with them, um, and some, but overall, it's still an overall um, good introduction to Stoic practice. And so um, you start Stoic Week by taking a series of surveys, which are psychologically validated surveys to kind of see where you're at about your mood and things like that. Then you do stoicism for a week where you step through things and perhaps discuss with other people. Um, and some group, some in-person groups like New York City Stoics on occasion does um, help provide some guidance for in-person discussion of Stoic Week. If you're interested in that, you can look on stoicfellowship.com and look for groups in your area and see if they're doing Stoic Week together. If you want some kind of social support for doing it, um, in-person social support. Um, but yeah, you take exercises for a spin and then you take the same battery of surveys at the end and, um, then that sees, then you're given the results and you can see whether it worked for you in certain areas, um, based on your answers to the surveys. And it provides modern stoicism with some data, um, in order to see what exercises worked and how to make them better. So it's also the beginning of a scientific stoicism. I love how it combines the objective with the subjective, you know, I, I, I used to have a problem with subjective kind of self summaries. Like, how do you think you feel right now? Because it's so subjective that can, you know, depend on your mood and all kinds of different things. But I honestly come to value that kind of metric more and more, the more I use it with people, because I do think the way that you feel about yourself or the way you feel about a certain lesson in your life, I think it's really, really important. Yeah. And these, uh, the metrics kind of help to see like how, well they worked and provide a little bit more objective way of evaluating that and so um I, if i remember correctly we do send the results of the survey at the beginning and the end and i would suggest if you're doing stoic week don't relook at your survey when you're taking the ending survey to try to give yourself as much a uh, clear-eyed responses to how well stoic week worked week worked for you um so you don't re- like kind of bias your answers Right. That's another thing that's difficult about the handbook is not to go back and look at your answers in your quizzes, which you provide in the beginning and the end of each one of the disciplines. I think that's a really great thing to add in. Um, But yeah, it's it's a little bit tough not to go back and kind of cheat. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We actually, one Stoic uh, week, we actually included those handbook questions in the questionnaire to see how well they predicted various things. And they did they did worse than uh, uh, another metric we provided, which was crafted by a couple of professional psychologists. So uh, but yeah, Mass and I just kind of winged those, although they made sense. And they, but they're actually still somewhat predictive, which is an interesting thing to see. Sure. Yeah. Dude, can you imagine how bummed I was when I finished the, 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 quiz for the first discipline. And it says, go back and check your answers on page 10, I believe. And so I flip back to page 10 and I completely missed it, <laughs> completely <laughs> forgot to do it. So I have absolutely zero frame of reference for how well uh, I did. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> Damn oh, it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's one situation where it actually may be worthwhile, or at least you could like make copies of the uh, quiz and then like maybe drill the exercises that you thought would be useful and then just retake it. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> that's great. Um, I do want to talk before we let you go about your work at Examine. Can you tell us how you got involved with with that kind of work and really critical uh, analysis of, of certain things, especially in like the nutritional and supplemental field? Yeah, so I'm trained as a pharmacist. I have a PharmD and i um, I decided to kind of take a look at alternative career paths because the traditional pharmacist career paths that were laid out didn't necessarily appeal to me. Um, But one of the things that I appreciated in pharmacy and in community pharmacy is like the most influence you have over people's 
healthcare decisions are usually like around like the over the counter medications and the supplements um, because people can just go and buy those. And so when people ask me questions about those kinds of things, I perked up a little because I got to use my brain a little bit. And <laughs> um, I found Examine um, in its early days and actually uh, applied to get on board. I think it was just a couple of people at the time. So I was one of like the first rounds of actual like hires there. And um, yeah, and they took me on board. And so I think that supplements are a very tricky um, business because there's a lot. It the regulation is sketchy. Um, so, for instance, it, even if, like, say, just as an example, and I'm not saying it does, but let's say fish oil works for well, fish oil does lower triglycerides. So let's go with that. Um, but how do you know that the stuff that's on the label? is necessarily what's in the capsule that you bought off the shelf and how do you know that it was packaged properly so that it's not oxidized and how do you know all these things it's a kind of a mess whereas if i buy if i get a prescription and get a prescription medication and they hand me a bottle i'm pretty confident that what they say is on the bottle is actually in there um that the pharmacist didn't mess up <laughs> packing the wrong pills that that's pretty unlikely that the manufacturer didn't mess up in making it like sometimes mistakes happen but overall i have high trust in that process. In going to supplements, it's kind of the Wild West, but yet people have different health conditions that supplements may work for or at least may nudge for. Um, I think supplements are kind of more the icing on the health cake than actually going to do anything dramatic to anything. It's always the basics of diet and exercise that kind of do 95% of the legwork. Um, but yeah, but for the 5% that it could help, like, um, you can buy supplements and sometimes they do help. Um, but the question is like, how does it work? Also, I was kind of shocked coming into the nutrition field as a pharmacist, just how much dogmatism there is and how many people are waving their um, keto flags or their, or their um, uh, insulin model of uh, obesity um, flags. And people have a lot of um, strong opinions and, um, as a, one of the sto main stoic practices is not holding strong opinions. And so I'm like, <laughs> wow, people are really super sure about things that are very difficult to study. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, so I, I joined Examine because there's no, we don't sell supplements. Nobody who is on the staff can have any ties to financial ties to a supplement industry. We, we sell processed information. We try to take the information that's out there in the science and turn it into more easily digestible knowledge. And we do that in a few ways. And I, we're actually, I can't talk too much about it, but um, we are refitting the site to make it even more um, interest, more useful and interesting in terms of getting exactly the information that you want about it. So wow. while the field of supplementation and nutrition, I'm more into supplementation than nutrition since I'm more pharmacy leading. I'm not a nutritionist, but um, the while there's a lot to be said about that, it's really hard to cut through the BS and get to what works um, and what doesn't. And um, that's Examine's uh, goal is to try to provide an unbiased insights into that for um, people who either want um, to optimize their health, like athletes and things like that, or people who are have these hard to treat or maybe even sometimes easier to treat uh things that can um that are still very impactful on people's lives um like hypertension and diabetes while it can be treated um sometimes diet definitely and sometimes supplementation uh can have some effect there sure yeah no you can thank us here in utah for helping to make supplementation the quagmire that it is we elected orrin hatch um <laughs> you know a long time ago and he was a, a, a really big part of getting the fda out of you know really testing supplementation products to see what whatever people claim is in them is actually in them. And unless a supplement is third party tested, you really don't know. Is that right? Yeah, you don't. I actually had a experience with a, I won't name a company, but I actually tried to get their, their, um, their analytics sheets for the supplements they were selling. And they said it was a trade secret and they wouldn't tell me. Um, but they said, well, oh, but rest assured, we definitely test this for purity and stuff. And I'm like, how do I know that if I, and they, they said that they run it through, um, they run it through, um, testing. Um, but, why am I supposed to believe them if I can't actually see right. the data? And some some supplement companies do provide the data, and then there's also external um, testers uh, like Consumer Lab and stuff who take supplements off the shelves and actually do the analytical chemistry to see what's going on in there. 
Mm, yeah, I, we always recommend supplements that at least have that third party, you know, verification, something, you know, that's very much more well reputable and, and is actually measuring that, you know, whatever you say is in the bottle is actually in the bottle. I am curious to know what is one thing that you used to know was totally true about supplements that you now no longer do? Hmm. One thing that I thought was totally true. Goodness. I would say, well, what the recent thing, so I thought that, so vitamin D went from like being the cause and cure for everything to being the cause and cure for nothing. And I still don't know, it's still a weak signal, but one of the things that's piquing my interest, I I'm a lot of people in the supplementation space are into like the sexy, cool stuff like ergogenics and, um, uh, uh, no tropics and that kind of stuff. I am, I'm more concerned with the boring stuff that kills a lot of people like cancer and, <laughs> and cardiovascular disease. <laughs> Cause while they're very well studied and stuff, first of all, you get to see, you get to know a little bit more with a little more certainty and also kills a lot of people. Like I'd rather do that than have a 5% increase on my attention or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, so like, um, like one of the things I'm watching in that space is vitamin D, um, being, uh, having some mild efficacy for well, questionably, like as a hypothesis, not a claim. Um, like it seems to have some effect at least in its daily dosed form on cancer mortality, not cancer, um, incidents. And so that's an interesting thing to watch that I'm trying to think a little bit more about and figure out, but there's this weak signal in several trials that are quality where you see a drop in, uh, cancer mortality, um, even though there's not a drop in cancer incidence and enough weak signals from different streams starts hinting at me, uh, that something's going on. So that's one thing I'm watching. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I guess that's one thing that's interesting. Also the physician's health study, um, too had, um, some interesting data that although multivitamins may have been a waste for a lot of people, there was some interesting data that it, uh, may have had some effects on mortality. Um, and a new study just came out, which is extremely high quality called Cosmos. And they did not replicate the physician's health study data. And that's like a big blow. So I, I was like, I was thinking like maybe older men based on physician's health study too should take a multivitamin. Like maybe it'll help them. And Cosmos, I still have to, that just was released a few days ago. So I'm still thinking about the implications, but uh, Cosmos's data is like, mm, maybe multivitamins are again, not a good idea. <laughs> Wow, that is fascinating. I spent the better part of my career telling everybody that they needed vitamin D, they needed fish oil, they needed for sure a multivitamin. And over the years, I kind of changed course and thought, you know, maybe throwing an entire suite of vitamins and minerals at somebody might might best case be a waste of money and worst case might be harmful. So I would be very interesting to see how that plays out. Um, and you said both studies were very high quality? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I can't wait to see the results of that. Yeah. I mean, it's an ongoing thing and we're talking about like weak signals. So it's like, it's, those are like the most interesting things that are on my plate right now. And of course there's the fish oil thing and heart disease. Like, uh, there's a lot of contradictory data there, but it's like kind of nuanced at the end of the day. And it, examine kind of tries to do that. And we want to do more of it because like, just saying like, take vitamin D it's healthy. Like that is vitamin D for the most part for most people is not, um, it's very safe for the most part, but there's also been a weak signal recently that older women surprisingly may have muscle weakness and vitamin D doses of over a thousand IU daily could lead to more falls. And that's counterintuitive because people were giving vitamin D and calcium for um, preventing uh, bone breakage and maybe improving strength because you see there's some lower quality studies that younger people, maybe if they take more vitamin D, maybe can get a little stronger. And then to see this counterintuitive result in older women who are falling more um, when they take anything above a thousand IUs um, daily is concerning. And so that there's not, there's not a one size fits all thing. Like I, would, though it's weak, like I would stop, I, unless there's a strong medical indication for it. Like I would tell my grandma, uh, if my grandma was still alive, like to think about not taking vitamin D if she was uh, taking high doses um, based on that. Wow. <laughs> this is so fascinating. I'm going to have to let you go and be respectful of your time. Otherwise I'm going to keep you on the line for another like four <laughs> hours. I love this stuff. That's so interesting. What a cool field um, to be in. And also very interesting perspective, you know, with, with your stoicism background and that practice and be able to analyze things without getting too tied into any kind of dogma, I think would be super, super helpful. The conversation, like I said, has been so much fun. I've definitely learned a lot from this conversation. What is one thing you would like to leave with the listener that they can take and apply in their lives? Um, I would probably say, 
I guess one, yeah, one, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with what I said before that like one of the things in stoicism is to be less certain about a lot of things, to not hold one's opinion so strongly. And given that there are a lot of opinions out there about a lot of things in the world, um, just take making, holding opinions loosely about what you need in life as well as what you think about things. And um, coming up with some alternative hypothesis can be useful. If people were a little less certain about strong beliefs they hold, I think there'd be a lot less infighting in the world. I totally agree. And I think the last few years have absolutely taught us that lesson the hard way. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Gregory Lopez, where do you want people to go to find you if you want people to find you or at least find your book and find your work? Sure. Uh, the book is called The Handbook for New Stoics, and it's all available over the place. If you're in the UK, it is uh, has a different title. Um, it is called Live Like a Stoic. Um, if you want to learn more about the basics for me, you could go to greglopez.me, and there's a contact form there if you want to reach out. And just uh, that's the basics of what I do. It's very bare bones. And I'm also very slowly putting together a couple of specific targeted Stoic courses for like more intermediate uh, Stoic practice. Um, it's not for beginners, but it is uh, going to be like targeted things that I don't see out there. Um, and you can find that at stoicmissingpieces.com. Excellent. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Man, this has been such a fun conversation. Gregory Lopez, thank you so very much for everything that you have done in your career, everything that you've learned and be so willing to share all your wisdom and knowledge freely and be able to think about things really critically, I think is really important. And your last point, I think is just absolutely paramount to realize that our opinions and views shouldn't be so strongly held all the time and we can do a much better job listening to other people and considering other points of view. So thank you so very much for all of your work. Thank you for the handbook of, for New Stoics. My wife and I just absolutely love it. And we can't recommend it enough to the listeners. So so thank you so very much for all your work and thank you for coming on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you for having me, Casey. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio. As always, thank you so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio. It's really inspiring and amazing to see some of the reviews that we have been getting and also to receive so many messages and emails about how these episodes have improved our listeners' lives. And so thank you so very much. We are so happy to bring these episodes to you and provide them for free. And we really hope that they help you in your life. Uh, we have just passed two major milestones, which is absolutely mind-blowing to me. And basically we did both of these in pretty much the exact same day. We have just passed 100,000 downloads worldwide of Boundless Body Radio, and we have just launched our 250th episode, which is absolutely amazing. Like I said, I never imagined we could reach that many people. We always want to keep you updated on things that we're doing on our website. So if you go to myboundlessbody.com, you can always see what we're up to. This month, we have a link that you can go and schedule a functional movement screen, which we do virtually over Zoom. A functional movement screen is a series of seven different movements and three different clearing tests, which is designed to find weak links in the body, such as muscle imbalances and joint stability issues. It's a really great tool for discovering inefficient movement. And even if you're not experiencing pain in certain areas of your body. It's something that can prevent injury later on. Some muscles need to be stretched, some need to be strengthened, and we can help you create a plan around that so that you can stay healthy and continue to move well for the rest of your life. So again, you can go and schedule that at myboundlessbody.com. You will also see the other services that we offer. You can always schedule a complimentary 30 minute consultation with us to really chat about anything that you like. And remember, if you are enjoying Boundless Body Radio, please take a minute, give us a rating or review on Apple. It really helps get this passion project out to other people. And thank you again for tuning into Boundless Body Radio.